And uh, as I mentioned, I'm Bill Hartung. I run the Arms and Security Initiative here at the New America Foundation. Uh, this event is about Eisenhower's legacy, the 50 years since his speech. And it's also to mark the publishing of my new book, Prophets of War, Lockheed Martin, and the Making of the Military Industrial Complex. I'm not one of these authors who's going to keep holding the book up, so I wanted to get that out of the way. Because, um, you know, why, should, why would you do that? Um, so uh, we have a special guest uh, via video, and we're going to do that first, uh, and then we'll start with the panel. Thanks. Until the latest of our world conflicts, the United States had no armaments industry. American makers of plowshares could, with time and as required, make swords as well. But we can no longer risk emergency improvisation of national defense. We have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions. Added to this, three and a half million men and women are directly engaged in the defense establishment. We annually spend on military security alone more than the net income of all United States corporations. Now this conjunction of an immense military establishment and a large arms industry is new in the American experience. The total influence, economic, political, even spiritual, is felt in every city, every state house, every office of the federal government. We recognize the imperative need for this development, yet we must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. Our toil, resources, and livelihood are all involved. So is the very structure of our society. In the councils of government, we must car guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizen can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals so that security and liberty may prosper together. Well, that concludes today's program. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, we can all give our own opinions of what we think that all means. Um, so uh, I'm pleased to have an overqualified panel, uh, including Gordon Adams, a distinguished fellow at the Stimson Center, uh, David Berteau, senior counselor at CSIS, and Daniel Bryan, the executive director of the Project on Government Oversight, more popularly known as POGO. Um, so I'm going to just make a few short comments and then I'll introduce each of the members of the panel in turn. Um, when I was thinking about this event, um, one of the things I was thinking about is, you know, how different is it from Eisenhower's day? And I had a few examples. These are sort of static statistics. They don't really capture the dynamics, but I'm hoping that the panel itself will get into that. Um, so I was thinking about different tools of influence. Uh, for example, the revolving door uh, between industry and government. And uh, Senator William Proxmire, uh, back in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, had a sort of statement on that that I thought was helpful. Uh, he said, the easy movement of high-ranking military officers into jobs with major defense contractors and the reverse movement of top executives and major defense contractors into high Pentagon jobs is solid evidence of the military industrial complex in operation. It is a real threat to the public interest because it increases the chances of abuse. How hard a bargain will officers involved in procurement planning or specifications drive 
when they are one or two years from retirement, have the example to look at of over 2,000 fellow officers doing well on the outside after retirement. So that was the Proxmire view. Uh, you may have seen more recently the Boston Globe did a couple great articles by Brian Bender. Uh, one of his findings was that 34 of 39 three and four star generals and admirals who went into the, uh, went into the defense industry either as consultants or executives uh, when they left the military. So this process continues. Um, in Proxmire's day, he had the Pentagon and industry help him with the survey. He found over 2,000 at the colonel or navy captain level had gone to the top 95 contractors. And he was looking at a study that Paul Douglas had done in the 1959 with about 700 moving at that same criteria. So this is not a new issue, and it's not even clear if it's more prevalent now, but it's certainly an important one. Um, in terms of campaign spending and lobbying expenditures, of course, we may never know what was spent in Eisenhower's day since they didn't have really the tracking mechanisms we have now. Uh, what we do know is that the defense industry is a big spender on uh, campaign contributions and lobbying, but certainly not the biggest. Uh, it spends about a third of what the pharmaceutical industry spends, about a half of what the insurance industry spends on lobbying and campaign contributions combined. Uh, now that smaller amount is certainly well targeted. Uh, the biggest contributor to Buck McKeon, the incoming head of the House Armed Services Committee, is Lockheed Martin, uh, followed by Northrop Grumman, uh, followed by other contractors. And he, of course, has major facilities uh, of several of those companies in his district. Uh, likewise, Daniel Inouye, the head of the Appropriations Committee in the Senate, has Lockheed Martin as his biggest donor. So the defense companies look at appropriations, defense appropriations, armed services, and members with uh, plants in their districts. Uh, they're not going to give money just because you happen to be a nice guy, I think, um, or a, a good woman. Um, and the other thing that I was thinking about was concentration of the industry. And um, you know, the budget, uh, according to the Department of Defense Green Book, budget authorities about twice what it was under Eisenhower. So you've got firms splitting up a bigger pie. And it's my belief there are fewer firms. I don't have hard data on that. But we used to have a separate firm called Lockheed. Uh, we had Boeing. We had Martin Air. We had McDonnell. We had Douglas. We had Rockwell. Those are now into two companies, Boeing and Lockheed Martin. And of course, we had Northrop and Grumman becoming Northrop Grumman. So uh, the concentration of the 90s, I think, has given us uh, you know, a, a smaller number of firms chasing a bigger pie. Uh, and you know, then there's the issue of advisory panels. Uh, do you have people who are consulting for industry also involved in Pentagon advisory panels, either secret or public ones? Um, and Brian Bender gave the example of a general who went to work for Northrop Grumman at the same time he was working on an Air Force panel on the future of stealth technology as an area of at least appearance of conflict. Uh, and then finally, there's the jobs issue. And I, you know, I, I couldn't really say what the share of jobs was in the economy then, although Eisenhower you know, cited a large number in the millions. I think he was talking primarily uh, military personnel. Uh, so in, in the context of a smaller economy, that was certainly substantial. Uh, but we know that jobs are a main driver of discussions about defense procurement. Uh, we had the claim of 95,000 jobs during the fight over the F-22. I think it's important to note that that plane was not built, uh, or rather the production was uh, ended at the point that the Pentagon chose rather than being extended. And so uh, the jobs issue is an argument, but it's not the determining argument in all cases. And I think there's a sense among some circles that somehow the defense lobby is all powerful, always gets what it wants, and I think that's certainly not the case. So um, those are my brief reflections. And now if I can find my introductory material, I will introduce my uh, uh, speakers. Uh, we'll have people speak in alphabetical order. Uh, oh, first, you know, I want to thank Stephanie Gunter, Kirsten Gilbert, all the events people here, Mike Jones, for helping make this possible. Anybody I've missed, I will thank personally afterwards. Um, so as I said, I, I really wanted this panel to be about Eisenhower and the military industrial complex and only to mark the occasion of my book rather than delve into the book. And uh, so we've seen Eisenhower's statement, the relevant part of his speech. Uh, now we're going to hear from Gordon Adams. He's a distinguished fellow at the Stimson Center. He's also um, done many other things. Uh, professor <laughs> of U.S. Foreign Policy at the Program uh, School of International Service at American University, 
uh, perhaps most importantly for our purposes, he was Associate Director for National Security and International Affairs at the Office of Management and Budget. Uh, so he knows this issue inside out, and I think he's going to have a lot to teach us uh, in, in his remarks today. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Does this work well enough that you can hear me in the back? Or do I need to get closer? I'll get closer. Um, thanks, Bill. Thank you very much. Uh, the, uh, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I was actually alive when Eisenhower made that speech. Unlike some people in the room, but like a good number, I sense, uh, when Eisenhower gave that speech. And there, to me, there is a, a really kind of a, a sort of uh, bookend character to being on this uh, platform today on this subject, uh, particularly with Bill, um, in two senses. One is uh, I uh, was, was sort of raised in graduate school as somebody who did a lot about national security and economic integration in Western Europe. That was my graduate school major. Uh, it, was, uh, it was not defense. Um, though I, in graduate school as an international relations student, I took a lot of security-related courses. Uh, and I got interested in the relationship between the industry and the government uh, in an odd kind of way. It was through Europe. I, in 1970, which is now 40 years ago, if I count right, um, I, uh, I got involved with just because I found it curious. I opened the New York Times one day and I realized that Rolls-Royce had been nationalized by the British government. And because I was a student of European political economy, I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. I wonder what that's all about. So I got some money and went over and started interviewing people in Derby and places in Europe. Uh, and I realized, first, much to uh, my ignorance, uh, that Rolls-Royce was not really an automobile company. It was a jet engine company. Um, and that it was the British uh, flagship jet engine company, and it was one of the three big jet engine companies in the world. And that the project which had sent the company belly up was the RB211 engine, which had been built for a Lockheed aircraft, the uh, Lockheed 1011 TriStar, uh, uh, which meant that if I wanted to understand why the British government had nationalized Rolls-Royce when that project got in trouble, I had to understand how the United States government related to the contractor who built the airframe for which the engine was intended, which was Lockheed, uh, which ended up getting me much more deeply involved in looking at Lockheed as a corporation than in uh, Rolls-Royce, as it turned out in the end. So there's an interesting bookend there in as much as your book focuses on the company that I first focused on when I was interested in this relationship, but via the European engine end of the project. Uh, and once I looked at Lockheed and realized that their large engine, uh, their large aircraft building capacity was uh, fairly directly related to their knowledge of large transport aircraft for the Department of Defense and the Air Force, that began to lead me in that direction. Uh, and uh, that's what brought me into this national security field directly as my professional career. The other interesting piece uh, for me as a, as a bookend is uh, in the late 1980s, uh, late, late 1970s, uh, among a number of people that I thought might be an interesting person to work with on stuff I was doing for an organization in New York uh, on U.S. defense policy and the defense industry was a young guy named Bill Hartung. Uh, so I uh, suggested that Bill might Very young, joins. very young. Very, very young. <laughs> Much younger than I am. Uh, so I hired Bill uh, in the process of working on a book uh, called The Iron Triangle, The Politics of Defense Contracting, which was my first major publication in this general area of this relationship. Uh, and uh, that, that uh, book uh, sort of has a long shelf life of some kind. Uh, but what it brought to my understanding of what Eisenhower was concerned about was the third corner of this triangular relationship, not just the Department of Defense and the industry, but the Congress of the United States, uh, that there was a relationship among the three. Um, and that book looked very hard at data that Bill has done uh, since remarkably well in a lot of his writing, lobbying, revolving doors, advertising by the industry, independent research and development, spending campaign contributions, uh, the whole series of th the nexus of tissue that links contractors to the Department of Defense, to the department itself. One of the things I realized by doing that, of course, was that budgets were key to this process, uh, to all defense process. In fact, budgets in defense planning are the centerpiece of defense planning, uh, which then drove me directly to create the defense budget project, and then I ended up at the uh, in the Clinton administration at the Office of Management and Budget, 
whether I, I learned things from the inside out or the outside in. I'm not sure which, which it was. Um, all of which brings us to today and where we stand today and what the relevance is of understanding uh, really the role of the military, the Department of Defense, the defense industry, uh, the defense, what I would call the defense stovepipe uh, in our national political culture and the way we view the world. I think if I wanted to uh, sort of reconceptualize what Eisenhower was saying, um, I would kind of reconceptualize it as follows, uh, in part because we are so fascinated, if not obsessed, by this set of relationships. We vastly overspend on the military. We vastly overuse the military tool. We vastly over-dramatize the military as the conceptual framework for our global engagement. Uh, and we vastly over-worry and overestimate the threats and challenges that we face in the world. Uh, in part, it's become part of the optic of the way we view the world. Um, what do I mean by some of these things? Um, overspending. Um, it's dramatically significant to me. It, we, we at the uh, uh, Stimson Center, uh, through the budgeting for Foreign Affairs and Defense Project, uh, had a central role in preparing the defense uh, options for the Rivlin Domenici Task Force on deficit reduction, and, and those options have been some recycled in an article I brought some copies of in the recent Foreign Affairs. Um, the, what was striking in that task force, and I think is striking in general in the way we deal with defense issues, is how little attention we pay to the enormous global military superiority of the United States. That we seem to have this debate at the fringe, if we don't do this project, uh, our capacity will decline. If we don't do that project, com country A, B, or C will suddenly become a threat. Uh, without stepping back and saying, the consequences of the investment that Eisenhower was talking about in his speech are the only global steaming navy, uh, total air dominance, uh, a ground force that is deployable on a global basis, a budget that is larger than almost every other country in the world combined, a research and development budget in defense that's larger than the budgets of virtually every country individually in the world, uh, special forces that are larger than the militaries of more than 100 countries in the world, a technological lead that is unparalleled, global communications, logistics, communications, infrastructure, transportation, intelligence. Uh, the capacity of the military forces of the United States is stunning. Uh, and when you go overseas, I see Guy Benary sitting here. Guy and I were talking in, uh, in Europe uh, over Thanksgiving with the Europeans in a NATO context. Uh, you know, the, the Europeans look at this capacity and say, my God, how can you be so afraid? The, the stunning chill that goes through most countries in the world when they look at the American military capability is palpable almost anywhere you go. Uh, we miss that point in our national debate about defense, which is the capability is unbelievable. Uh, we also, second point, tend to overuse it. Uh, and we have expanded the capacity that we are overusing. Uh, I was very struck by the Quadrennial Defense Review that the number of missions that are now laid out as missions of the Department of Defense and the Uniform Military covers an increasingly broad range of things from deterrence and conventional war fighting to global presence to power projection to counterinsurgency to stabilization and reconstruction, nation building, strategic communications, humanitarian relief, building partner capacity, fighting the narcotics war. We have enormously expanded the mission set. Uh, and it was st striking in the QDR in my judgment that that mission set had been expanded without setting any particular priorities or without any significant calculus of what risks we were prepared to accept and what risks were more important than others. Uh, we, so we have now overused the tool. Uh, it's not an inappropriate tool, but we have overused it. Uh, thirdly, we tend increasingly to conceptualize how we organize the government around the use of this tool. Uh, I am thinking particularly of the, the, the slogan du jour of a couple of years ago, which may be less of a slogan du jour today, whole of government. All right, well, whole of government as a slogan didn't mean there's a whole lot of interesting international problems we need to deal with that we need to get agencies to coordinate on and to work with each other more effectively. Whole of government meant uh, how do we do the mission set post 
combat in Iraq and Afghanistan in a more integrated way between the various agencies of government that ought to be at play in that situation. Uh, that whole of government, in other words, was a whole concept torqued around a choice by the United States government, whether you agree with it or not, to invade Iraq, to intervene militarily and ultimately to invade in Afghanistan, came in the opposite order, uh, to at very in various ways occupy those two countries and then end up with the consequences of an op occupation, uh, which for which our military was woefully, inadequately skilled, prepared, tasked, funded, or anything else. Uh, so whole of government really be was a mantra designed to solve the problem of Iraq and Afghanistan, but not a decision about how the tools of statecraft ought to relate to each other in America's global engagement. Um, the same on a narrower sense because that was the mission post-conflict reconstruction and stabilization. It's very interesting to me that the new quadrennial diplomacy and development review that came out from the Department of State, USAID, in its chapter on post-conflict, uh, reorganizes and refocuses the context for their concerns in the civilian instruments, not so much in whole of government, but in what is the civilian mission? What is conflict prevention and what's the civilian mission? What is conflict uh, recovery and what is the civilian mission? What is the role of the civilian instruments of statecraft with respect to uh, governance in other countries in the world independently not disconnected necessarily, but independently of the military role and mission. So we tend now to increasingly organize ourselves around concepts that have to do with a very large defense establishment. What are the consequences of these trends? Uh, one of the things in the briefing last Thursday that Secretary Gates and Admiral Mullen gave that really struck me was an answer that Admiral Mullen gave to a question that was raised from the floor by one of the members of the press corps. Uh, where Admiral Mullen said, and, and Admiral Mullen is a very interesting guy, uh, the budget has basically doubled in the last decade. And my own experience here is that in doubling, we've lost our ability to prioritize, to make hard decisions, to do tough analysis, to make trades. Very insightful comment about the consequences of a very large establishment uh, that is the legacy of what Eisenhower was talking about. I think to sort of wander my way towards the conclusion here, the, the piece of this that concerns me most, and maybe it's just that I get older, is the conceptual piece, is the framework for thinking about our engagement that is now so dominantly oriented towards the uses of our military capacity. In my own judgment, uh, military capacity is a very important tool in the toolkit of statecraft, uh, but it ought not be the dominant tool in the nature of US global engagement, that that is a civilian direction and a White House directed direction. Uh, but we tend more and more, and Andy Basevich has worried about this a lot, to worry about how the military tool will take on missions and functions and what threats the military faces. The concluding comment I wanna make is that um, all of that said, Remember, Bill and I were in a discussion at the Ford Foundation some years ago on this. Defense budgets rise and fall. How curious uh, that uh, the, the ability of whatever this relationship is to continually keep a budget at level, even keel, uh, is not, does not seem to be totally successful. They tend to do so with variations in war and peace. Uh, as we are in conflict situations or cold wars, uh, the, the uh, capacity and the funding rises. Uh, as we leave those situations, the capacity and funding decline, and that is a normal cycle. Uh, but um, why does this happen? Because I think we lose policy attention, uh, we lose political attention, uh, the importance of this declines. Uh, I had an opportunity this past weekend to spend a little bit of time with the new members of Congress, uh, and what was very interesting to me was no matter how many times you tried to orient the discussion towards defense, their concerns were debt, deficit, small government, spending control, taxes. Defense was about number six in any issue set that anybody was concerned about. Uh, so externally, uh, exogenously to this stovepipe, uh, budgetary considerations, economic considerations, domestic policy considerations, play an important role in the variation. 
And in policy terms, when we are at peace, there's less attention. Now, footnote to that. Secretary Gates said last week, and he said it before, he doesn't want us to do what we've done so many times in the past, that we build down and then suddenly we find ourselves having to build back up because of some threat that we didn't anticipate and we shouldn't make this mistake. I have to say, I think balderdash is probably too strong a phrase for that, but close. Uh, that since the Korean War, that has not typically been the pattern of American build-downs. That we have built down but maintained a very large defense establishment. That the conflicts that we have been in, we have largely chosen. Vietnam, Gulf War, Iraq invasion. That we have had the capacity to carry out and execute those as choice, choices of policy. Uh, that we've encountered difficulties in those wars, not because we were unprepared, but much deeper concerns about the way the military instrument is organized and what its mission is designed to do. Uh, and we are in another one of those cycles. We are in a build-down cycle, in my judgment. Uh, and it's not unlike the one we went through from 1985 to 1998, when we took 700,000 people out of the military, 300,000 out of the civil service, cut the procurement budget 50% in constant dollars, cut the defense budget 36% in constant dollars, and despite the fact that some people worried about readiness, I think wrongly, in the 90s, despite the fact that some people worried about force stress, they didn't know anything before they got to Iraq, uh, we actually had a military force that was quite capable of executing the mission they were assigned by the Bush administration in 2003. Uh, and we are in that kind of cycle, in a world atmosphere where we are probably more nationally, existentially secure than we've ever been in our lives. Uh, and we have an exceedingly effective military. Now, what does it take to execute one of these build-downs, which is cyclical in the United States? Well, I have to conclude, to come back to the picture, it takes a Republican. Because despite, despite the mythology that it's Democrats who are anti-defense and Republicans who are pro-defense, most of the build-downs that we have gone through have been executed by Republican presidents. This guy, in the 1950s, after the Korean War. Nixon and Ford after the end of the Vietnam War. Uh, George Herbert Walker Bush after the end of the Cold War, then subsequently joined by Clinton. But most of the build on I just described was executed by that very, very liberal, uh, excessively anti-defense Secretary of Defense, also known as Dick Cheney. Uh, you know, Cheney managed that build down uh, and very successfully. Uh, and we have today a somewhat more divided political situation where the highest defense budget that we've had in our nation's history in constant dollars is under a Democratic president, but a Republican Congress, which is taking a very hard look at whether defense ought to or ought not be on the table. Thanks. I'll stop there. Thank you, Gordon. Uh, I'm standing up here because uh, I forgot to tell you a few things, and they're written on the podium. Uh, <laughs> this is on the record, and it's being filmed. So when we get to questions, it's important that you wait for the microphone and identify yourself so it it uh, comes across well on tape. Uh, there may be other instructions along the way, but those are the ones that I thought were important and should have said at the outset. Um, now we're going to hear from David Berteau. He's a senior advisor, and he's the director of the Defense Industrial Initiatives Program at CSIS. He was a director for National Defense and Homeland Security at Clark and Weinstock. He was a director for National Security Studies at Syracuse University and a professor at the Maxwell School. Uh, he served 12 years in the Department of Defense under four different defense secretaries, including four years as principal undersecretary of defense for production and logistics. Uh, so we'll hear from David now. Thanks. Thank you, Bill. Um, I note that uh, even though you said we're going in alphabetical order, we're also going in order of age. Um, and I'm, I'm delighted with that because uh, <laughs> uh, Gordon, that hurt again? Gordon, re that's right. Gordon <laughs> referenced, of course, uh, uh, being alive when Eisenhower made the speech. And I, I think it's interesting to actually look at what the historical uh, construct tells you. Um, for those of us who were alive or, or who even had the opportunity to watch him make that speech, uh, it seems not that long ago. But in reality, Eisenhower's speech is closer to um, the um, assassination of the Archduke Ferdinand in Sarajevo than it is to today. Uh, and so it's actually quite a bit 
uh, back in the past, and I think sometimes it's useful to have that kind of, of perspective. It's actually also closer in time to Eisenhower's famous missed tackle of Jim Thorpe in the Carlisle Army game uh, than it is to today. <laughs> so uh, for those of you who stayed up late watching an irrelevant uh, uh, um, uh, industry-promoted football game last night, um, I would have watched it if TCU had been playing, but not necessarily for the powers that were there. It's really useful, and I'm glad that Bill started out by talking about what's changed, and actually some of the points he made are really quite cogent and relevant to our discussion today. I think I'd like to focus on a couple of other things that have changed since January 17, 1961. One of the things that's changed is, uh, in fact, people spend a lot less time on their speeches today than they did then. Uh, Eisenhower actually started working on this speech in May of 1959, fully 20 months before he gave it. Uh, when's the last time any of you started working on it? Uh, Bill wor started working on his book probably 20 months before it was published. Uh, 1961, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, but by and large, except for academics, most of us live on a much tighter time scale than that. So what's different now than it was then? Uh, Eisenhower actually had a world that even though to him it seemed uncertain, it has a lot more certainty uh, than the world does today. He knew what his steady state requirements were that he was facing from a military uh, commander in chief point of view. Uh, and he knew what his military missions were. We have a lot of trouble articulating those today and nailing them down. Um, he's also, he knew what his threats were, and it's interesting to look back at his threat description. I'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, there's a, a difference in terms of the importance of the globe. In 1961, there were whole swaths of the planet that were largely irrelevant uh, to any, uh, whether, whether uh, from the point of view of our national interest, to anything that matters today. It's a little difficult today to say what place is unimportant uh, to us uh, as we look forward. Uh, but perhaps one of the largest differences is the global economy uh, in two aspects. One is, in fact, the U.S. as a percentage of global GDP, and it's roughly half, slightly less than half of what it was 50 years ago. It's still astonishingly large and, and twice as large as our nearest competitor, um, but that's substantially different than it was in 1961. Uh, a more difficult one to measure, though, is the global impact of technology. The technology development, and Eisenhower actually spent some time on this in his farewell speech and the, and the importance of research and development and technology development to our national security enterprise. But in those days, almost every significant technological advance was, number one, innovated and developed in America, and number two, probably funded in part by defense. That's true today for some elements of our national security establishment. But for a broad swath of it, everything from communication satellites to information technology to sensors and data fusion to even robust things like chips and, uh, and printed circuit boards, uh, the real developments are not occurring in defense and the real market is no longer in defense. It's occurring in the consumer commercial market uh, where issues of reliability and availability are dramatically different than they were for what defense faced in 1961. And those are important elements to keep into consideration. Now instead of defense-led, it's really a commercial pull. Another area that's changed dramatically, and I, I suspect that we'll talk about this uh, more this morning as well or this afternoon, is the issue of using government in, or using industry to provide services to the government. This was largely not a topic of conversation in, uh, in Eisenhower's time. As many of you know, at the Center for Strategic International Studies, we not only track uh, contract spending for hardware and platforms, but we also track professional services spending across the government. And that's gone up slightly faster than spending on hardware across the whole federal government or spending on goods, that is, as opposed to services. And it's continuing to increase even as not only the budget goes down, but the administration claims that it's reducing the amount of money. It's still actually going up in terms of services. And interestingly enough, at least uh, uh, two-thirds of that money is spent by the Defense Department, uh, um, roughly out of uh, a little under $300 billion a year uh, of, of services, uh, including research and development, uh, that uh, and a $200 billion of that is DOD. So DOD is by far the largest share of that. And the largest contractors are, in fact, for defense, mostly the same as the largest hardware contractors. So there's some interesting correlations. But much of the ways in which we evaluate and even budget for uh, uh, defense doesn't take that into account. Um, the real problem, though, is not necessarily in contracts, although that's where the evidence might seem to be. 
it's in requirements. And there we have actually not made much change since the time of Eisenhower. Um, there's, there's still very little civilian control and influence over requirements, and I'll come back to that as I look at some of the solutions. Um, another element of change is the manufacturing base in the U.S. Uh, defense is still, from a manufacturing point of view, our defense manufacturing base is still technologically, as Gordon so ably pointed out, far in advance of much of the rest of the world. Uh, we may be worried in the newspapers about the J-20, but we're certainly not worried in the same manufacturing base sense uh, that we will be in 20 or 30 years from now. Uh, but its dollars are way down from what it was. On the global commercial competitive manufacturing base, we have definitely slipped, both in terms of, of quantity and in terms particularly of quality. Um, one of the interesting examples of that is shipbuilding, where we build superior uh, warships. In fact, uh, no one can hold a candle to them, but they cost substantially more on any metric that you would use from a manufacturing point of view than commercial shipbuilding. On commercial shipbuilding, we've essentially abandoned the playing field uh, to other countries, Korea, Japan, et cetera. What's intriguing, though, is if you look at the history of countries like Japan who can build really good, much cheaper commercial ships than we can, they cannot build better warships and cheaper. In fact, they build less capable warships and they're every bit as expensive and take every bit as long as ours do, which suggests there's more than just the manufacturing base at work there. One thing is still the same as it was in 1961. In fact, it's probably exacerbated. There is an economic relationship of monopsony and monopoly uh, between the defense industry and, and the U.S. government. One buyer, one seller in all too many cases. What this does, among other things, of course, is it changes the standard basis of economics, of supply and demand, the laws of competition, et cetera. The second thing it does is it opens the door for Congress to engage itself here so that instead of competition, we have allocation, and instead of attrition, we have maintenance. Uh, unless, in fact, the executive branch is clear and consistent and competent in the way it defines its requirements, builds its budgets, as, uh, as, as Gordon alluded to, and then defends those budgets in front of Congress. Congress has an opportunity to have a lot of say in, in it. And in, in fact, you could, you could make the case that what Eisenhower should have talked about is not just the military-industrial complex, but the military-industrial-congressional complex, because that is, uh, in many ways, the third point of the Iron Triangle, if I remember your book correctly. Um, my key conclusions here, it's easy to focus on the back end of the process, the budgets and the contracts, but I think it's important to pay attention to the causal elements as well. And these are the ones that we really need fixed. Uh, there is still today no coherent requirements process in the Defense Department that ties requirements to cost and time and that integrates those requirements across a real strategy on which priorities can be based and trade-offs can be made. Absent that kind of a process, real requirements with affordability, real priorities set across a national strategy, not just a defense strategy, and real trade-offs made early enough in the process to make a difference, it's really hard to do what Eisenhower suggested, which is to avoid the accumulation of unwarranted influence. And finally, there's no good way to connect outcomes to any of that strategy or those requirements. But we need to be careful of what we're fixing. Um, there's a lot of talk, for instance, about the negative impact of the revolving door, and it's easy to find examples where this is, in fact, uh, both either the perception of a problem or, in fact, a real problem. But you need to be careful that you don't end up cutting out people who know what they're doing as a result of fixing the revolving door. Um, because it, it turns out that government by rookies is almost as bad as government by crooks. Um, cutting defense missions uh, without developing the capability elsewhere, which is part of the demand that we face in, in many countries around the world, uh, where defense has migrated into missions, whether through their own design or because of a vacuum, uh, only, only time can tell as you look at them, but it, to eliminate the defense role in there without building up the capacity of the civilian agencies to take that on uh, would be foolish because you end up not being able to do it at all, and that's generally not the outcome that we're looking at. Um, I know that uh, many in this room have been firm advocates of building up the civilian capability side. Uh, I still look for evidence that such is occurring, and I look forward to seeing that evidence as the QDDR is implemented. Um, 
and I'm probably young enough that I might see some results that come from that. Um, there's a, an interesting way of looking at industry and saying, you know, if we just had a control over profit, we could control cost. Um, what's interesting about that is it's the antithesis of what the commercial economy has shown us over the last 30 years, which in fact the best way to cut costs is to allow companies to profit from reducing cost. Uh, I have an, an interesting example, an internal study that I was doing with the Defense Department. Uh, we had a very senior contracting person who told us point blank, he says, you know, it's a lot easier for me if it costs a billion dollars but there's only 3% profit than if it costs 500 million but there's 30% profit. Because nobody can actually question what the real cost ought to be because we really don't know what the real cost ought to be, but everybody knows what excess profit is. Now this is akin to me going to my car dealer and saying, I'd be glad to pay you twice the amount of money for that car as long as I know you're not making anything on it. That's not the way I buy a car. It's probably not the way you buy a car. There are also some lessons from downsizing. And Gordon pointed out that we do go through these cycles and we can absolutely be certain we're going through these cycles again. One of those lessons comes from base closures. One of the privileges of my life is I got to close bases for both a Republican Secretary of Defense and a Democratic Secretary of Defense. It's a great way to make friends. <laughs> you, uh, you, you end up, uh, uh, you Try know, working at OMB. <laughs> <laughs> yes, equally, <laughs> equally good. Uh, it's a little more visible. You know, I would go to a base and they would say, uh, Dave Berto, please go away. You know how I put those signs out on, at, at the side of the road as you, as you come in. Um, but one of the lessons of the base closure process is be careful what you get rid of because it may be hard to bring it back. And that's why I think that the idea of downsizing without a framework of overall requirements of a national strategy, of a set of priorities, and in fact a process for making trade-offs uh, will likely lead us to making some conclusions and decisions that we will regret downstream. Much of that is in fact what Eisenhower was guarding against. It's interesting to look back at his description of what was then the Soviet threat and ask ourselves, is any of this still relevant today? He talked about facing a hostile ideology and he used five descriptive phrases for that ideology. One was global in scope. The second was atheistic in character. The third was ruthless in purpose. The fourth, insidious in method. And the fifth, of indefinite duration. Now, it's interesting, and whether you agree or disagree with Gordon's uh, assertion that the threat is overemphasized, the characterizations of that threat in every publication put out by presidents uh, over the last 10 years, Democrat and Republican, exhibit four of those five characteristics. The only one missing is the atheistic in character element. And so in many ways, despite my opening comment that the threat has changed dramatically in terms of certainty and global, global uh, dimensions, um, in many other ways, the threat being faced today as it's characterized by the government uh, is in fact quite similar to that threat that was described by Eisenhower in his farewell address 50 years ago. And I think it's that that has to be the starting point of a real analysis of Eisenhower 50 years later. Thanks very much, David. Uh, now we'll hear from Danielle Bryan. She's the director of the Project on Government Oversight, which to my mind is one of the most effective watchdog groups in Washington, D.C. They work not only on contractor accountability, but increasing nuclear security and fighting excessive government secrecy. They run a highly successful series of seminars on congressional oversight for Capitol Hill staff, and they do a lot of other things which we can talk about later. Thank you. Thanks so much, Bill. That was very sweet. Uh, I, I thought I should actually give a little context. I saw that in the announcement for the event, there uh, was a reference to the fact that DOD is awarded a little over $300 billion in contracts. Actually, that's sort of lowballing it. It's getting closer to $400 billion. So when you're thinking about the defense budget, more than half of it is actually spent on contracts, which is... Louder, louder. All right. Let me do this. Am I not on? It's on. I just have to... Do my big voice. Okay. Uh, the, the point I was love making the is love that, the love the mic, all right, um, is that uh, more than half of the defense budget is actually being spent on contracts at this point, which I think is an important thing for us to put in context. And of course, even though Bill doesn't want to talk about his book, he's my friend and I do want to talk about his book, <laughs> uh, Lockheed, of course, is the winner of that um, competition uh, as the number one recipient of government contracts 
across the board. Uh, it's also interesting to know that of the top 10 government contracts, they're actually receiving 25% of all government spending, of all government contracts. So when you're thinking in terms of how powerful these companies are, uh, imagine how for 25% of all of the government's contracting to go to just 10 companies, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Northrop Grumman, General Dynamics, Raytheon. I mean, as you can see, these are all defense contractors that are just massively relevant to, um, to the government's business. Uh, the other thing that's important POGO has been doing for the last few years has been tracking the misconduct of the government's contractors. And Lockheed also is actually only in second place in terms of the number of instances of misconduct only beat by uh, ExxonMobil. Actually, BP is on the other side of it. So, um, so it's not as though they're, they're necessarily getting so much of the government's money because of their... Um, their performance as a responsible contractor. Uh, but I, I do want to uh, highlight a couple of things that Bill talks about in his book with regards to Lockheed because I think there is such an important part of what has happened since the uh, Eisenhower speech. The first was those mergers in the 90s. When we were testifying against those mergers because we were concerned about the lack of competition that was going to be created as we saw the shrinking number of companies that we could be, um, the government could be doing business with, Industry was arguing that we were going to be, we the taxpayers were going to be benefiting from these mergers because of efficiencies that would be created. That would mean that weapon systems would be costing less. So we can now have enough time, and I'd, I'd like anyone here to tell me what weapon systems now cost less than they did 15 years ago uh, because of these mergers. It was this fabulous promise that was being created that was uh, so obvious on its face that it wasn't going to happen, and of course it didn't happen. Um, but what Bill talked about that we didn't realize at the time was that there was actually, and that's always so interesting when it comes to how policy decisions are made, there was actually sort of a professional relationship between Bill Perry, who was uh, the person at the Pentagon who was sort of engineering the government actually paying for these mergers at a time where the companies were laying off thousands of their employees, uh, with Norm Augustine. I forget, what was the actual, they had worked together in some capacity? Uh, he had done some consultant work for Martin Marietta, which Augustine headed uh, before he engineered the Lockheed Martin merger. So it was, it was a, a great win for Lockheed Martin, um, and I would argue a huge loss to the, to the taxpayer. Um, and uh, I think a significant change that's happened since the, uh, since the speech. Uh, because what we create now is the concept of the too big to fail company. Uh, and what I think is important, and I'll talk about it at the end when I uh, discuss what I think we can do about it, is that perception of the too big to fail, uh, I think, is, um, isn't necessarily accurate. I mean, I think it has been dominating how Congress approaches uh, defense contracting and uh, whether to continue with a lot of these weapon systems, but uh, that was one of the best things for the companies that came out of, of those mergers. Uh, the, the other thing that, that Bill talked about that we were, uh, that was, so that was a battle that we lost. Uh, but a battle where we won was on the F-22. And it was interesting when you were raising that as an example of, well, the military industrial complex isn't that powerful because they sometimes lose. To, to, I still can't believe the, the forces arrayed in order to win that battle. L let's remember that President Bush said he didn't need any more F-22s. President Obama said he didn't need any more F-22s. Secretary Gates said he didn't need any more. The Secretary of the Air Force said he didn't need any more. Uh, and we were still losing. <laughs> we were still getting them anyway. The Congress was absolutely in lockstep uh, with pushing for them. And, and as something that's important to point out, uh, I don't think it's really quite been mentioned too much yet here, is this is so not a partisan issue. Our champions on that were Senator McCain in the Senate and Barney Frank in the House. It's maybe the only issue that they've ever agreed on. Um, and, and the people who were continuing to push uh, you know, really aggressively for the F-22 were Democrats, Chris Dodd and, um, and Senator Kennedy's office. Um, and, and to think that it took absolute sort of, the Secretary was threatening veto of the entire defense authorization bill if he was forced to buy more F-22s, and it was, it was a, um, a pitched battle. And, and so I think it's important to, um, to put into context that it's true that we won on that battle, although the, F, uh, the, the Joint Strike Fighter essentially sucked up all the money that was saved, I think, from the F-22, so one might argue how much of a win that ultimately was. Um, 
But I would argue that it, the fact that it took two presidents and all of this and, and, and still we almost lost sort of puts into context that, that really the military industrial complex remains incredibly powerful. And it is largely because of that, that one element that d both David and Gordon referenced, which was the Congress. And I think it's true, right, that the early drafts of the speech actually had the military industrial congressional complex. And I really wish he'd left it in. I mean, if I could have edited well, it. There's some him. question about whether that word was in the drafts or not. There's a new book by James Ledbetter where he says, you know, he doesn't find it in any of the drafts of the speech. But I think it was certainly in Eisenhower's mind. It, he wanted to partly uh, talk about how he could work with the Congress. So I think he left that out, even though obviously the Congress was part of the problem that he had to deal with. Uh, he, he chose not to mention it. And, you know, c the Congress is my favorite branch of government. It's just that when it comes to these issues, they're just, they're like spoiled children sometimes. <laughs> and, it, you know, it is not about reality. And it's, it's, um, it's, it's incredibly difficult to work with. And I think um, it, it's just so important to emphasize what uh, Gordon had said, this, this myth that, at least when it comes to the Congress, that, that Republicans are pro-defense and, and Democrats are not is just utterly ridiculous when it comes to life inside, life inside Washington. So, um, so one of the things that I hope we can talk about, and I'd love to hear Dave, David's uh, perspective on this as well, is is what it comes down to when it comes to the Congress is uh, really the industries over time. I, I remember when I first started doing uh, doing this work uh, in the '80s that it was really exciting and rare when you could get one of these secret maps that, that contractors were distributing in Congress showing how many jobs were each in each district because it was so shocking that they were being so um, venal in, in uh, trying to buy congressional votes. Now they put them up on the web and it's so obvious. I mean, it's, it's sort of a, a, part of, a, a part of how Washington works and it's, it's not shocking anymore. But um, if, if, I would argue, if, if what we're talking about is just a WPA and this is really about jobs and not about national defense, uh, why are we not having more of that conversation about is that the most economic way to spend government money is is just through the defense contractors and um, and and feeding the military industrial complex? So uh, the the thing that I really did want to also put on the table is this too big to fail, because when you look at what these companies or Lockheed in particular are actually doing for the government. It's not so much the bending metal. It's, it's, you know, yes, it's true. We have very few companies that can build ships. And we have very few companies that are uh, able to assemble an aircraft. But so much of the work that's involved in all of these contracts is either, as David was talking about, the services, IT. Does Lockheed have to do all of this? Uh, or it is essentially sort of a systems integrator where they're they're giving the work to many other companies. And uh, if we're looking for a solution to sort of breaking up the military industrial complex, I think it would be in getting the government to, and I understand there are, uh, we're losing efficiencies in this, but unbundle these massive contracts so more companies can be competing for them. Um, now that when you, you know, when you look at, when you look at what it is they're actually doing, it is really getting the contract and then subcontracting the work out to you know, hundreds of other companies. So I think I'm going to stop because I'd rather hear a conversation than me talking. Thanks, Danielle. Uh, I think first, if any of the panelists have reactions briefly to what's been said, and then we'll go to questions from the audience. Uh, I had one, one, com one thought that was triggered by uh, both what uh, David and Danielle said. Uh, part of the, uh, the price of being old, or maybe it's the reward, I'm not sure which it is, uh, is that I've had the opportunity to watch the cycles of work on these issues uh, as we've gone through time. And, and what's interesting here is an awful lot of what uh, Dave was saying and Danielle was saying about the nature of the problems or the capabilities in the industry uh, has been around for a very, very long period of time. There's a whole body of literature that goes back to the 50s and 60s by people like Fred Shearer and Ron Fox and uh, Jim Kurth that talk about the follow-on imperative, the absence of competition in the industry, the, the, uh, the extent to which the industry has become merged, the extent to which that's reduced competitive opportunities. It is a cycle historically that has gone back at least to the 1940s. 
uh, where if you, if, you, if you now draw a wiring diagram of all of the companies that were prime contractors in the top 100 of the Department of Defense in the 1940s, and you watch the process of merger and consolidation, it's a continuum. It, it's not really something that happened because Bill Perry and uh, Les Aspen held the last supper in the 1990s. That's the latest iteration, if you will, of a process that has been almost inexorable throughout the history of defense acquisition in the United States. And it's always been rightly accompanied by a concern that this meant the diminution of competition in the industry. Uh, absolutely true, and, and one could argue that there's been precious little competition in this industry for a much longer period of time uh, than the period from the Last Supper in, in the 1990s to the present day. It really is a very long history indeed uh, that goes way back into the 1940s. So the number of airframe contractors or shipbuilding contractors alike uh, has all gradually shrunk over a very long period of time, and arguably because the maintenance of the industrial base was an important policy consideration, the Department of Defense has never really rigorously enforced competition. It's come, it's gone, it's come, it's gone, it's come, it's gone. But essentially the maintenance of the base on the Defense Department side tends to preempt what may or may not be the virtues of competition in the industry. Now that, that's, I'm giving you a simplified paradigm, but over time that has been th the logic of that relationship. The other point I wanted to make is that uh, it's very hard to make uh, uh, competition pay in terms of price in this business. Uh, when you're dealing with expenditures that emerge from a political process, now, what I mean by that is when, you, when the budget is being put together for a system, the incentive within the Department of Defense, again, with a 50 or 60 year history on it, is to underestimate the cost that a system is going to involve. Uh, and this is actually a process that I've seen as part, part by my participation in decision making settings in the government that the most optimistic cost estimate tends to be the one that the services would prefer to have and the most pessimistic cost estimate, which usually comes from the CAG or its successor, is one you would prefer not to have, uh, because that has huge advantages in the political process of putting a budget together. Preceding that incentive, the incentive for a contractor to honestly project even a banded assumption about sets of costs for the programs that they want to bid, uh, also is, contains the incentive to underbid, uh, because you want to be able to be sure you get your foot in the door on a contract. And if I were in the contracting business, and I know a lot of them, that's exactly what I would do. I want to make sure I got the business, and I would be very optimistic. It, it ends up with, a, with a, a, a somewhat comical rule of thumb that I have about the acquisition of major programs, which is they usually cost twice as much, take twice as long, and give you half the performance of what you originally had in the estimating assumptions when you first started the program that you're, that you're buying. Uh, so it's extremely hard to reap the private sector advantages of competition and pricing when you're working in a political system of budgeting as the source of funding for the program. Um, thanks, Bill, for the opportunity to, to make a couple of uh, additional comments. Um, we have a tendency, of course, when there's a problem in a government program uh, to think that it must be industry's fault and not the government's fault. Um, I think that tendency is easy to track because, in fact, industry is usually the one performing the work, and so therefore they're the one falling short. But all too often this comes into a, a problem at the government's end, at the front end of the process. One of the things that I think both Congress and the executive branch have agreed on, and this is a bipartisan issue over the last few years, is the absolute necessity to rebuild the competence and capability of the government's workforce at every level here. I know that, that everybody from, from POGO to the Chamber of Commerce, uh, and, and I don't mean to say that those two are the <laughs> bookends kind of here, um, but uh, has, has <laughs> agreed uh, very, very strongly on that point. It is easy to take the capability of that workforce down um, all you have to do is let people retire and not hire their replacements, and it disappears uh, uh, quite quickly. It is very difficult to build it back. Uh, we have places today, government agencies today in the Defense Department, where fully half the people have fewer than five years of experience. And because of the cyclical nature of this business, you don't get enough experience in less than five years to be able to deal uh, with the kinds of issues uh, and, and uh, judgments that have to be made here. 
I think there's also a, a problem in the way we narrowly define competition. You know, every morning I face a competition in my own mind. Do I ride the metro to work or do I drive my car? And increasingly that competition makes me seek a third option, which is how about if I just stay home? Uh, all of you who live and work in Washington know the, the, the benefit of that. Um, you know, I don't usually think of it in terms of that third option as a, as a competition for my transportation uh, time and dollars, but in, in the, advance, the advancement of telework does in fact make it a legitimate option, and it's one that uh, increasingly I can consider. There could be a, you know, a video screen of Berteau sitting here participating in, in, this, uh, uh, in this very uh, event this morning. We tried to do that, but we couldn't get it worked out. <laughs> well, there's no technology at my That's end, I can guarantee had. you that. Um, also, I think it's important to recognize there are a number of solutions being put into play here, and it's really useful to recognize how long it takes to go to those. Uh, Gordon mentioned the tendency of the government to put the lo lowest or, or the most optimistic cost in, because that's the way you can get more programs in the same amount of budget dollars. You know, the passage of the Weapon System Acquisition Reform Act last year uh, by the Congress, uh, the first legislation that I can remember um, that was passed unanimously at every level, subcommittee, committee, floor, and conference, uh, and went from initial draft to a signed bill in less than four months. It was a phenomenally productive exercise, and one of its key tenets is, in fact, the necessity to have the budget dollars for a program be those that are the most likely cost, not the most optimistic cost. Only time will tell how well this works out. I know that both the Pentagon and the Congress have been paying very close attention to this since it was put into play, and I would submit it actually has something to do with some of the uh, terminations that Secretary Gates proposed both back in 2009 and, uh, and last week. And so the, the, uh, the evidence of the legislative and executive branch working together for some of these is, is quite powerful. I have one final comment that I feel compelled to make. Uh, the implication made earlier that somehow Secretary Bill Perry personally intervened in any of the mergers in order to provoke gain for either himself or any of companies that have been previously associated with, I think is antithetical to both uh, the nature of, of Bill Perry as a man and uh, the position that he occupied. I've known and worked with him for almost 30 years. I don't think there's a single individual I've ever worked with that has a higher level of both personal and professional integrity, and he exhibited it over and over again uh, throughout his many times in the, uh, in the government. And, uh, and I, th I think it's important for that record to be, uh, to, to be laid out there uh, as part of our conversation this morning. Um, I certainly didn't mean to impugn his integrity at all, but I do think that, and this is part of the issue with the revolving door, relationships in Washington matter. And it matters uh, in terms of people's perception of what's best for, for the companies, for the country, and um, I stand on you know, that being the, uh, but, but that does uh, remind me that I did want to make a little more conversation about the impact of the revolving door. Uh, because that has been something that we think is a tremendously uh, invasive problem in Washington. Um, this is one of the things that POGO is planning to really focus and tackling on this coming couple of years. And, um, and another Lockheed example of the revolving door was the, uh, the Pete Aldrich example that I think Bill has in his book where uh, Pete Aldrich was in the Pentagon. You know, we've interviewed people who had been hearing from him again with the F-22, that it was a bad idea. He was on the, was it the DAB, the Defense Acquisition Board, that made the decision to go with it, and then within a year, he's on the board of Lockheed. Go ahead and, and defend his integrity. <laughs> but I'm really bothered by that, because, because at the end of the day, uh, from, uh, from my perspective, the biggest, the most invasive problem f uh, created by the revolving door is if you, how do I have faith that any person who is in the public sector is really focusing on the best interests of the public when they have in the back of their mind they might be going to, they might be dealing with right now their future employer or someone who in a few months they hope to have some negotiations with. And, and from our perspective that is something that has just got to, got to stop. I just, I want to make a, a, a small sort of biographical comment about that because I think it's one of the ways in which you try to uh, uh, put another way, I think the the tension between what uh, Dave said and what Danielle said is palpable in the government. Uh, Dave's point is a very important one. You, you risk, because of the nature of our system, throwing the baby out with the bathwater. 
uh, if you simply deny people who have knowledge the opportunity mm -hmm. to use that knowledge, uh, you have a terrific problem, at least of appearances, if not of substance, if you simply allow the exchange of personnel to go unregulated and untransparent. And balancing those equities is a terrifically important, difficult, but incredibly important thing to do. Uh, one of the things I was trying to do in the Iron Triangle when I wrote it 30 years ago was to increase the transparency with which we knew things like this were going on because sunlight itself mm -hmm. is incredibly Absolutely. important in, in ensuring more ethical behavior in the transfer of people or in any other part of this, of, of this relationship. I, w I was thinking as I was talking about the first time that when I was at OMB and in, within the first couple of months, I, went to, I, I was invited out to lunch by a guy who was my predecessor in the job by a couple of administrations uh, who had subsequently become a division director for a major defense contracting company. Uh, and I went to the ethics officer and said to OMB ethics officer, can I have this lunch? What are the rules about the lunch? Uh, who can pay for the lunch? And his advice to me, because the, the ethics officer can play an incredibly important mm -hmm. role here, was almost impossible because this man was a friend of mine, was first off, I recommend you don't have the lunch because mere appearance of having mm -hmm. the lunch mm -hmm. is a potential <laughs> problem. He said, second, if you decide you have to have the lunch because it's a friend, he can't pay for it, mm -hmm. that I understood. Thirdly, if you have the lunch, don't talk about business. Mm -hmm. This is a professional colleague and yeah. friend. It would be very hard to draw the line, you know, how are the kids? <laughs> Great, and, and your wife? Yeah, and uh, how's your golf game? Uh, you know, we obviously were going to talk about defense because that's the right. business that both of us were in. But the, being the very careful. Is, uh, golf game is professional, I think. Golf is a professional <laughs> business, too. It, well, in my golf game isn't professional, but that's neither here nor there. Um, you know, that you, you do need that kind of attention to these relationships uh, in the government and a, a regular process of scrutinizing how the industry behaves internally in its own companies with respect to ethical issues to ensure the transparency and that everybody's kind of minding the store. It is a never-ending requirement for maintenance. You know, there's actually a great opportunity for that happening in that uh, a couple of years ago, the uh, DOD authorization bill included a revolving door database. So uh, DOD is actually already tracking people going. It's just not public. And this is something we've been pushing the Obama administration in its embracing of open government, that you're already making the database, just let us look at it, you know? There was a regular reporting requirement when I wrote my book, and of course this was way before the age of databases and computers, uh, because it was in the uh, late 1970s. So I went down, sat in the Pentagon Library, and went through the hard copy binders, Good of which you. there was nine feet when we were doing this research, because there was a, in fact, legislated reporting requirement that forms had to be filed by people who had moved from one side to the other. So uh, now we can take a few questions. Don't forget to wait for the microphone. No interest out there. <laughs> and, and by the way, the lights are shining on us. You're sitting in the dark, so we have no idea who you are. Uh, yes, here in the, <laughs> in the middle, Chris. Except I see Chris and Bill here. Right, yes. <laughs> middle of the front row, yeah. Well, I'm a bit surprised that uh, can, can you identify Christopher you? Payne with the Natural Resources Defense Council. Um, I'm a bit surprised that none of the panelists have mentioned what was a, a major theme in Eisenhower's speech, which was the, the opportunity cost of the military-industrial complex combination. Uh, you know, uh, in, t in terms of uh, other investments that the political system might have made, and he, he specifically referenced the fact that these military-industrial contractors could make other things that were of greater use to the society. And we see that today. You know, Boeing, if it had been building high-speed trains for the last 30 years, would have a nice high-speed rail network in this country. We wouldn't be uh, in the basement of, uh, of transportation as far as industrial country, advanced industrial countries are concerned. Just one example. So I, I want to ask the panel to address that, that issue, because it seems to me it's, it's the issue that's actually paralyzing any forward progress uh, on some of the major agenda items before this administration. I, I totally agree with you, Christopher, and that was what I was inarticulately trying to say when I was making reference to if we're using this as a WPA, why does it always have to be for uh, military purposes when there's so many other purposes that would be theoretically better both for the economy and for the country? Well, as Gordon, as Gordon well knows, the experience of, con of conversion, industrial conversion to other satellites, so it's a, it's a more complicated question than, than the first question. Mm -hmm. 
uh, Christopher, I'm, I'm, I'm appreciate you raising that. I mean, one of the key elements of, of Eisenhower's whole speech was the need to maintain balance. And in fact, he used that word o over and over again. Um, I apologize for not being clear in my comments. My whole point of having a, a requirements process that looked at priorities and trade-offs was, in fact, in the context of that larger balance. Similarly, with respect to government capability, not just housing everything in, in the Defense Department, but having government capability across a broader spectrum of agencies. But I think it has to come in that context of, of supporting and maintaining balance. But there's another side to that coin as well. I had the privilege at the end of the Cold War to chair the Defense Conversion Commission, which was a year-long look at the question of what can the government do to help those companies that have been dependent on the Cold War for their revenue become competitive commercial companies in, in other parts. And as you point out, the, the question of industry conversion is woefully uh, sad. Uh, there are not a lot of successes there. One of the key things that we saw from our study, and there's, there's huge, there's a, not, nine, not nine feet, but about three feet of data uh, that, that came out of this. We did have a computer. But, um, uh, but the, is, is the, t the lag time for what the government decides to do and how long it takes to get that money out and spent and in place um, dwarfs the capability of the commercial market to respond. So companies that were waiting for the government to tell them what to do, mm -hmm. in other words, you, we're not going to buy your tanks anymore, but we're going to tell you what else to do. We're flat out of luck. That's why the, the success stories are, are so thin. I think what you need instead is a different incentive structure that, in fact, rewards companies for diversifying, for expanding, for applying the technology more broadly. And that's been almost as elusive as, in fact, the, the uh, failure of industry conversion that you point out. Um, I'm tempted to say what they said, but uh, since I haven't said it yet, I guess. <laughs> um, the, what's interesting to me in this area is that the, um, in Eisenhower's era, the place that, and David's re alluded to this in his remarks, uh, the place that the defense industrial base occupied in the larger American economy was significantly larger and different than it is today. Um, and, and while these industries, while the big firms are very large, uh, and in the case of places like Lockheed and Raytheon and what have you, highly uh, dependent, if you will, as a firm on this relationship uh, and not on doing anything else, and their history of trying to do anything else is, a, is riddled with failure, um, the, the reality is that the industry that supplies the Department of Defense, as Dave said, is significantly different. We're, much, we're in a world of... Uh, where, I, where I like to say we're not really talking anymore about a defense industrial base. That's a very old think, mm -hmm. in my judgment. We're talking about a defense manufacturing and technology base. And even that is old think because it's really a manufacturing and technology base with certain small pieces of it, very defense related, but the vast majority of it, firms that are doing work largely at the first, second, third tier subcontractor level for prime integrators who are largely commercial companies. Mm -hmm and whose technology is pushed from the commercial end rather than from the military end. So there's a real huge evolution. And that entire capacity is so, that is purely defense, that the degree to which this business is purely defense is now such a small proportion of any industrial or technology sector activity or of the American GDP as a whole that it's really no longer possible to make some of the arguments that circulated around the discussion that Eisenhower had in his speech. We're talking about a very different phenomenon. And the department knows this. The department knows that it's drawing on a commercial base. It has a harder time figuring out how it gets its needs met because the commercial base is the base that says, you know, I'll profit for you, I'll profit for somebody else, but I'm not necessarily going to hang around for all of the comedy routine of a defense acquisition process. Uh, it makes the whole process very difficult. And so I've always been bemused in, in recent administrations, starting frankly with our own, uh, the Clinton administration, at this kind of old think attention to how we maintain the defense industrial base when frankly the manufacturing and technological base is doing what it's doing, increasingly independent of what the defense department is doing. So uh, it, it's, it's not useful, I think, analytically to talk about Lockheed, Raytheon, uh, McDonnell Douglas is gone, um, you know, completely absorbed general dynamics and what have you, as reflective of the relationship between the Department of Defense's buying and technology investment and what the private sector provides for them. Um, 
the the question then for me, Chris, comes down to a, a budgetary question, and that's really, really hard to grapple with because there does not appear to be a political willingness to invest the resources in the public fisc in technologies that are not security related. That is the hardest thing in the world to gin up the dollars for in a political sense. So if you're saying high-speed rail, which the president's arguing for very hard right now, high-speed rail ought to be a huge investment in the future. And if Boeing does it well or uh, Northrop Grumman does it well or somebody does it well, they get to compete in that market for the public dollar for high-speed rail. Getting the adequate investment in high-speed rail is extraordinarily hard in this country in this political system. What advantages the Japanese or the French or the Germans or anybody else is the ability of their political systems to do that kind of investment and make it stick, which produces a more adequate high-speed rail transportation system than the one we're able to produce. Why is that? Oh, wait. I think we need – we're kind of running low. So uh, I'm going to take just three oh, questions, and then we'll wrap up done. because, unfortunately – uh, that's where we're at. Uh, yes, right here uh, along the wall, and then uh, over here, and then in the back is waving. So we'll go in that order. Okay, Bill Goodfellow, Center for International Policy. The, the elephant in the room in this whole discussion is the deficit. I read a piece yesterday, an interview with David Stockman, Reagan's old uh, budget director, who said that what Gates has done so far is merely a pinprick of what's really necessary, mm -hmm. talking about really major cuts in the, in the military budget. And that brings up something that Andy Basevich has been talking about. If you do that, then it's going to be very hard to maintain our global uh, policeman role. And that we really, as part of that, will have to redefine the role the United States plays in, in, in a multipolar world. So I guess the question is, will the deficit require these sorts of cuts that will require a, a real rethinking of our role in the world? All right, so uh, let's take the other two questions to and then we'll, we'll deal. Um, yes, you already recognized there. So, Thanks. Uh, Eugene Goltz from the University of Texas. Um, so I had two things I wanted to quickly raise. The first on the 90s defense consolidation and the revolving door issue. It strikes me that the strong critique of what happened in the 90s is that the department failed at stewardship, the Department of Defense, and didn't direct certain companies to merge with others with a strategic agenda, in fact, did nothing. Let the companies decide who to merge with, which means, the you know, prevents the revolving door from having had any influence on who merged with anyone because the government didn't tell anybody who they should merge with. The, the thing politically that really shaped this and prevented the efficiency gains you're looking for is exactly the kind of rhetoric that came in the panel, which was the payoffs for layoffs comments, right? So what shaped the mergers was the prevention of industrial rationalization post-merger because people like Bernie Sanders and Tom Harkin coined the phrase payoffs for layoffs and stopped the government from trying to have a rational adjustment and shrinkage of the defense industrial base, right? So it was the mechanism of the pres preservation of a large military industrial complex was because the department didn't manage, abdicated management because of the political imperative of jobs and lobbying that, that blocked it. So I, I, I just have a very different view of, yeah. of I think is the, the, actually, I think my view is the mainstream view, but in any event, uh, of what happened in the 90s rationalization, the reason we didn't get, uh, the reason we had a continued military industrial complex. And the, the other point that I wanted to raise and just get comments on, particularly for uh, uh, David's uh, comments, he talked about a, a need for an integrated requirements and budgets process. And this sounds like a, a really uh, a good way to deal with the problem of the military industrial complex because requirements don't consider budgets. And I, I guess the first thing I would say is to take it back to Eisenhower. He's actually the great example of when this worked, right? Eisenhower set a ceiling on the defense budget, there was a real cap, told the services, you can figure out what your priorities are and what you want as long as you spend less than this cap. But there was political leadership, and in fact, this is exactly what Eisenhower called for in his speech, right? It was statesmanship and leadership to preserve the balance and, and, and uh, preserve liberty. And um, so we have had this, but we haven't had it in a very long time. And the last thing to say, though, is that David, I, I, you suggested that 
key issue was have civilians in, interject balance and budget control, and Eisenhower did that. I'm not confident that this is a civil military issue. I think it's a, we need a mechanism for whoever's setting the requirements to consider budgets in some way, but civilians, particularly given the military industrial complex logic we've been talking about, are often, maybe for lobbying reasons, just as freewheeling with spending or even more freewheeling <laughs> with spending. And so the question I would have you guys answer is, um, how do you think you can get the budget constraints into the requirements process? Okay, so we're gonna take one last question. I really meant to call on the person at the end of your row there, so I don't wanna uh, squeeze them out. Tom Cummins from the Foundation for Applied Research, and this really is to Danielle, because I know it's something that's very near and dear to their heart, which is government accountability. At the end of the day, who really gets held accountable when we talk about um, the DOD budget, when we talk about the DOD spending. I bring that up because back in 1995 when I was in the Marine Corps, I went down to Lockheed Martin and I was shown the prototype for the C-130J. And for all these wonderful things that Lockheed was supposed to be doing on their own nickel, they said it's not gonna cost a dime more than the C-130 it would replace. Which was, and that time I think was about $15 million. And what we've seen with the C-130 is, the J, it's $65 million plus. Actually, nobody really knows. We saw the price of the F-22 go from what was supposed to be $100 million per unit to $350 million per unit. The Marine Corps, very near and dear to my heart, we saw the expeditionary fighting vehicle go, uh, I mean, the thing's gonna be $25 million uh, versus originally I think it was supposed to be five or six. So at the end of the day, who gets held accountable either on the government side or the industry side to really deliver as promised? Uh, okay, I'm gonna have to call it there because we wanna give the panel a chance to respond and then I'll have a sort of a final thing to say which will be very brief. All right, uh, on the deficit question, I think that this new Congress is gonna be fascinating as, as Gordon has said, I think that they are uh, largely coming from a completely different worldview, and I think that if defense is on the table, I think, Bill, what you're talking about, it really, we could see something very different uh, in Washington. Uh, on the political imperative, as much as I think Bernie Sanders and Tom Harkin would like to think that that language really changed anything, I don't think it did at all. Thousands of people were laid off. I don't think that there's anything in the Pentagon uh, or any effort that would have happened in the Pentagon that didn't happen in terms of engineering who was merging with whom, so I, I, I don't see the world at all that you saw. And I do love the last question, because um, no one is, I mean, we the taxpayers are held accountable because, and the troops who don't get what they actually need. Uh, the, you know, the companies regularly get bailed out, they, they pay you know, more than uh, the, the Congress gives up and pays. And I guess the, uh, the legislation that you were just talking about that just passed last year is making a little harder for these weapon mm -hmm. systems that are going over the uh, nunn mccurdy breaches now, I, I, in theory, maybe we may see a little bit more accountability on the major defense acquisitions. Uh, explain nunn mccurdy just briefly. Uh, wow, okay, it's, oh, I can't do the percentages. Can you do it when you go over a certain percentage? if you percentage? go more than 25% percent over, something happens to you, which is. And now it's a little bit more than something. Now e you actually e have to go back to an earlier milestone. Either the program is terminated or the Secretary of Defense has to certify that it is essential to national security, re-baseline the program and put a new cost on it and say, this time we're not gonna overrun. So not dollars. a lot of accountability, <laughs> but a tiny um, bit maybe. At least you're paying a little more attention. And there have been remarkably few non mccurdy breaches that have been allowed to terminate. In fact, I think Bob Gates has more of them than any other secretary in history. Oh, absolutely. So yeah. Just not many. Not many, that's right. Uh, I think the deficit is in fact uh, um, the probably the single biggest change in a way from where what Eisenhower faced. And it's uh, uh, because this time the cyclical is not going to get us back uh, to where we have been before, which is a manageable level. It's easy for people to say that defense is not really part of the cause of the deficit, it's really entitlements. 
Uh, I don't actually think that's true, but even whether you believe that or not, because that's kind of a tenet of religious belief, if you will, uh, the arithmetic dictates otherwise. It's 20% of the federal spending, and, uh, and, and it's very difficult to conceive of any scenario which gets deficits under control with that defense playing a significant participation in that process. The difficulty is what is it that you give up when you get rid of the money? And that gets to, to Eugene Goltz's questions of how do you integrate requirements and budgets. I would certainly agree that um, uh, it, it looks like a civilian military implication. I would also note that uh, Dwight Eisenhower really only looked like a civilian to the military. Uh, to the rest of America, he still looked like General Eisenhower. Uh, he just took his uniform off for the time being. And, and, uh, and from that perspective, it's very instructive. If you look at Eisenhower's 1958 budget, and some of you might have to go back and read Richard Neustadt again, um, but Ike, on the day he released his budget, authorized his Treasury Secretary to go attack it in public because it turned out he had created a bigger deficit or bigger de uh, deficit for that year's budget than he knew. Now, that's partly his fault, right, because the budget was his set of decisions. So we shouldn't idolize uh, President Eisenhower all that great with respect to his stewardship for uh, integrating requirements and budgets. Nonetheless, I think the example is very powerful. It is the only way that we're going to be able to rationalize defense's contribution to deficit reduction with any kind of budget that's going to produce real value for the American taxpayer as opposed to just protecting those things that come into play. I think the real culprit with respect to preventing rationalization was neither um, the uh, industry itself nor the Defense Department, but the difficulty of getting Congress to go along with it when you propose a closure. And I really think we've turned a corner there. I think what Bob Gates has done has demonstrated both the necessity to make the case and, and to stand with with it over and over again. Uh, it was not only Gates who threatened to veto, it was Barack Obama in his mm -hmm. statement of administration uh, policy. Mm -hmm. I went back and looked at the last 50 years of SAPs on the defense authorization bill. It's the first time ever that a president cited a weapon system program as a rationale for a veto, even though you tried to get him to do that a number of times, I think, w when you were at OMB. With respect for accountability, I think the important element is that we need to look at the question of accountability at the front end when we're assigning people to these positions and selecting them for these jobs, not at the back end after they're done. It's harder to do, but this is the question, of, and, and this is the question we keep coming back to because it is in part the revolving door issue. There's an enormous difficulty in getting qualified people to step in and do these jobs. It is even more difficult to get them to do it in a way that looks like it really is clean. And I agree with both of my colleagues up here. Transparency and visibility into information is by far the most powerful element of that and the database should be made public. Thank you. Uh, just very briefly, and uh, in sort of overarching response uh, to all the questions, it's always difficult to uh, influence a teenager's behavior, uh, but probably one of the instruments that has a greater influence than any other is to cut their allowance. <laughs> um, and to some degree, one of the lessons that I take from my experience in government working on these issues is that, is that you can do this kind of thing or the Simpson Bowles kind of thing until the cows come home, and they're useful. They provide you with illustrative options. They can highlight key points that you ought to look at if you're dealing with a downsizing budget, some areas of opportunity. And I was delighted to see that in some of the areas that we recommended here or that Simpson Bowles recommended were actually directions that the Secretary was taking. But the Secretary's action is a drop in the bucket. The Secretary of Defense is still wants real growth in his budget, and by fiddling with the fiscal 11 baseline, he's going to try to argue that he, in fact, got real growth mm -hmm. in his budget. Uh, that is both the internal constituency and the public visibility management that the Secretary thinks he needs to do. But frankly, the best discipline in the Department of Defense has always been less funding. Uh, top down rather than bottom up, because you can argue all the bottom up system arguments that you want to have and my favorite rock and your pet rock and my, my waste is your essential program mm -hmm. and the rest. In the end, if you have fewer resources, you have to set priorities. You have to do better planning. Uh, at $700 billion a year, we are vastly over generous in terms of resources provided to the defense function of the United States government. And as Admiral Mullen says, it has incentivized misbehavior. It has essentially incentivized no priority setting, no choice making, no analytical basis for the decisions that are getting made. Uh, and what will happen, and I predict we are in a downsizing end of the cycle here, 
is as we begin to come down, it's going to force more and more attention to the priorities that need to be set, to the management choices that need to be made. And frankly, I watched that process for the five years I was at OMB when the dollars were down and did not go up and saw that there's an enormously capable bunch of managers in the Department of Defense who can make very good choices when they're pressed to make choices. We do not automatically get the best defense out of more money. We may get better defense with less. Here, here. Well, I'll take that. Um, <laughs> so I want to thank Gordon Adams, David Berteau, and Daniel Bryan for a great panel. Uh, thank you all for coming out. I'm sorry we couldn't get to everybody, but it was a good turnout and a good panel. So the two uh, conspired to make it not everybody could get their question answered. Um, I have a small commercial. <laughs> I promise not to hold my book up more than twice in any event. Um, th this evening at Bus Boys and Poets at 6.30, uh, I'll be in discussion with um, Chris Hayes, the Washington editor of The Nation, uh, about the book. There's leaflets outside, or you can go to the IPS Institute for Policy Studies website, and it'll show you uh, where it is and how to get there. Thanks very much. Thank you.